here. That's great. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> um, so, so just to get started, why don't you say a little bit about yourself, who you are, what, what you are to SunFest and what is SunFest to you? Sure. Um, yeah. So Mercedes Pasha, uh, the core artistic director for the organization. We're a nonprofit organization here based in London, started back in 1989. Um, but obviously we're very well known for our free festival, free summer festival, TV Sunfest. And that's been going on for 25 years. This would have been its 26th physical edition, but is now a virtual new <laughs> adjacent side to what we used to do. Mm. Um, so yeah, the festival has been free the whole time because mainly we want to make sure that we uh, include as many people as possible in order to access these this amazing talent that's available from all over the world and bring the world to London. Um, so in terms of my role, I've been involved uh, for 25 years with the festival itself because my family founded the organization and the festival. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. So even as a little girl, you know, seven, eight years old, I was going around with a donation bucket and just doing what I was stuffing envelopes or, you know, bringing wow. artists to Sam or something like that. Amazing. So I did that. And then, um, I've been in this role of, you know, um, I guess you could say artist recruitment and um, artistic direction between for about 10 years now, um, attending different music markets around the world in order to scout artists, in order to contribute to the music industry um, through various panels or workshops, conferences, things like that. Um, and then, you know, for SunFest for me, well, it's my lifelong project. It really just is. Um, I've been, delved into different professional um, activities, I guess you could say, uh, in terms of my education. Like I have a master's degree in French. Um, I was a teacher for a few years. I then got a marketing degree. I was in marketing for a while. Um, but I always, always, always came back to SunFest and I was always involved with SunFest. That was always my, on top of my 40 hours a week type thing. Mm -hmm. um, but last year I finally made the transition to just full time do this and do other events as well. Um, just because between you and I, like it was burnout. <laughs> I just couldn't do it anymore. So I had to pick like what would feed me uh, personally and professionally the mm -hmm. most and that was working in the nonprofit world and it gave me the flexibility it gives me the flexibility to work on other projects as well if I want to um, so one of the big things that I do is that I do work with other conferences I work with other festivals and events um, just in terms either in a consulting capacity or just working with them in general when it comes to their events setting up logistics etc so I've always been responsible for um, the site the actual festival site so setting it up mapping it out um, liaising with the vendors, things like that. So it's been a big family effort too. My mom's involved at the festival. She also, she helps me with the food vendors and then I take care of the rest. My brother helps me with the setup. So if there's any issues that come up with the setup, then we're the crisis team on the golf cart, making sure that everyone's okay, <laughs> that everyone has access to power and water, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so it is a very family centric event. Um, and that I think got, gets relayed um, through the event as a whole. I think, um, you know, last year, for example, we had a radio station come in from Chicago as part of NPR. Um, and they came to check it out because they were doing a 25 year anniversary for themselves and doing a road trip. Mm -hmm. And so a friend of a friend, you know, got us connected and said, well, we're celebrating 25 years. How funny, how great would it be if you guys came? Mm -hmm. And so they did a few live to airs, a few recordings just to kind of, you know, talk to some people here that are Indigenous and, you know, the, the barriers that they've faced. They talk to us in terms of our barriers, what we've faced. Um, they talked to a few MPPs to see what the landscape was like for arts and culture. And they came back and they enjoyed the festival. They went to go see a box, they shopped, they ate. Um, and, you know, they just, the one thing that they said that sticks out, they're like, this is the biggest family friendly event that we've ever experienced because you can come with your entire family you have five kids bring them you don't mm -hmm. have like some kind of ticket or paywall that prevents you from having a great time with your family and that's something that like really makes us proud of what we do is that people have grown up with the festival just like i have other people have grown up with the festival so to mm -hmm. now have working in professional relationships with people my age or a little bit younger, a little bit older who say, I went there as a kid mm -hmm. and now I'm bringing my kids. And like, it, that's really exciting to me because in the end, it means that our messaging is getting through of just 
inclusion, diversity, acceptance, you know, um, making sure that like we're all here to contribute something. We all have commonalities, we all have differences, but that celebration is beautiful. And like, what's to say that having difficult conversations can't be done in a really fun celebratory way, such as dancing, listening to music, having a beer together, or, you know, eating together, or, you know, shopping together. Um, so that's, that's one thing, you know, and like in a way that our strategy kind of works is that we have this massive vendor marketplace and that's for two reasons. One, it helps us fund the festival, keep it free, but two, it offers an opportunity for everyone to find something that they like. So mm -hmm. some people strictly come to shop. That's okay. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's totally fine with us because then they can stay and listen to the music or they can support our breweries or, you know, they can support the local restaurants that do participate in the festival, as well as the traveling artisans and, and restaurants that come and, and partake with us. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then some people strictly come to eat. And that's great too. <laughs> you know? I know they are not wrong. They're, they're, they're going to miss. They're going to not miss the lineups, but they're going to miss the food. You know, and so that's that's wonderful to hear those things. That there are reasons that people come and say, "My favorite thing is to go to this booth and buy this, and then go eat, and then sit in front of the stage and just discover because I don't know who these acts are." Mm -hmm. So that aspect of discovery, I think, is super important and really key because if you think about a lot of the commercial festivals, you know, big ones like I don't know Lollapalooza or Oshiaga or Rock the Park or you know Coachella a lot of the times they're selling acts or they're selling tickets to this event because they're huge renowned acts. And like, they have this bill that's, you know, massive headliners on top and then like the smaller acts on the bottom. But yeah. for us, we're, like, we're all the same, you know, it's, it's yes. all good. You're yes. Discovering amazing artistic talent. Some of it you might not like or love, like there could be people who really don't like jazz or who really don't like um, electronica or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's all right. There's another band. There's another stage for you to go out and discover. So that's, that's something that we want. We want like this fully immersed experience. And for this virtual edition of the festival, unfortunately, we can't do it 100% the way we want it. But at least people can discover new acts discover their favorite acts again uh, mm -hmm. because it's a mix of both they can go shopping on our digital marketplace which launches tomorrow um and then we're gonna heavily just let them know these are the festival or these are the uh restaurants that go and support our festival we'd like to support them now and we'd like you to complete uh to go and support them as well by ordering takeout you know mm -hmm. and so that's the way that we can somewhat create that experience of course it's going to be in a person's own backyard but at mm -hmm. least they can they can dance like they want to. They don't have to feel ashamed. Yeah. I just don't know how to salsa. It's like, well, just keep your feet fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Seriously, having solo dance parties in like the garage mm -hmm. has been so much fun. And it's actually been something that I started doing. <laughs> really? You know, yes. You like set times for yourselves and you're just like, oh yeah, I'm going to dance at this time. <laughs> kind of, kind of. It's, it, or there's more, it's more like a, you know, I really feel like I need to dance right now, you yeah. know, and I'll just play, play some music. And, and I don't think people have, because this whole virtual thing is still really new, um, but a lot of uh, not only festivals, but even like weekly events that were normally taking place um, in different cities you know they're now virtual and online and you can actually experience a festival or a city that you were never able to buy tickets for or were never able to travel to to go see in your yeah. own room in your own Absolutely. backyard in your own living room mm -hmm. um and no it's not like the same experience of actually being in the same room with dozens of other people who are all experiencing the music and you know you bounce you exchange energy off of one another and plus there's the live yeah. band or the live musicians no mm -hmm. it's not like that um but what's great about this kind of thing happening this kind of shift is i think it really focuses people on the music you know and in sunfest there's a whole lot of other elements to sunfest and as somebody who i myself grew up going to sunfest as well and it, it was always something to expect every single summer from mm -hmm. the longest you know as long as i can remember and i'm i'm one year younger than sunfest so <laughs> <laughs> so literally it, it's been yeah. around you know since i've been around here in london yeah. um there's so many other elements to sunfest like you were saying the food the shopping the sitting outside, the actually going downtown, um, and the fact that it's free makes it very accessible. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
as, as I'm, I'm going to ask you about the history of Sunfest in a second. Um, but as far as coming back to the roots of one of the main essences of the festival, I, I can say is probably the music. Of course. Uh, right. So, so this focus on, on, you know, just watching only the music and being zoned in on that does bring people back to, to what it's all about, you know, and to, to focusing on the sound of the music, the quality of the, and the talent of the performers. Um, that's one positive side, you know, that, that's kind of the brighter side of these, all these different virtual events that are going on. That mm-hmm. and, and that for some, it's, uh, it makes it a lot easier to access for some, mm-hmm. you know, those who have internet and, and laptops or other devices. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, no, I think, for us, that was our priority, you know, in the end, mm-hmm. like whether or not we do the digital marketplace or anything like that, it would have been artists. It would have been the mm-hmm. music that mm-hmm. we continue to showcase and that we continue to advocate for. As I mentioned previously, you know, a lot of our work is within the industry itself. So mm-hmm. therefore cultural advocacy, advocacy for um, music organization, music presenters, uh, for the artists, for agencies, you know, being in discussions with them, um, working with agents to create block booking in order for them to get gigs all over. So we're in contact with other presenters in order to create that tour so that they can maybe access government funds, kind of like Canada Council for the Arts, where artists get touring grants. Mm-hmm. They can then access those funds in their country. So if we really want an act, and they say, okay, well, we need two more presentations to, in order to create a tour, in order for us to apply for these fundings, then we're going to help them do that work. And we're going to work with our partners um, across the country, really. Um, we mostly work within the, um, like, Windsor, or sorry, to D- Detroit to Montreal corridor. That's our main corridor in terms of presenters that we work with. But we work with people out west as well. So it's like, it's, it's this, you know, it's this huge ecosystem that we work within and that we prioritize our prioritize has our priority has always been bring excellent music you know Mm -hmm. bring excellent music from underrepresented genres have people discover allow that artist to have a platform to Mm -hmm. to spread their art and speak their message allow audiences to receive them you know and so i think for us it's it's the music will always be the heart and soul Mm -hmm. always because that's how it started really and so it started because you know, Alfredo, my dad, he was noticing this influx of immigrants, including my family himself, um, and that we were largely being siloed into these stereotypical frameworks of what music was from those countries. Mm. And so, and it wasn't, and, and that's fine. That's beautiful to showcase as well. But it was an opportunity really to showcase the professional emerging contemporary modern acts that were coming out that still had roots to their you know traditions or their folkloric rhythms you know what i mean and so therefore it's showing that um that artistic quality that comes out from these countries that's that's the main priority of the festival but in the end the music acts as a bridge in order for us to kind of come together and understand and bob our heads together celebrate dance cry whatever it is that you Mm -hmm. make the music makes you feel it's super important to have that vehicle because in the end Shopping won't do that. Food won't necessarily, food might do that, but not necessarily. Do you know what I mean? But those are, those are kind of, I guess, magnets to bring people and say, hey, come here, check it out, have fun with your friends, go into the trees, be outside in the park, support local business around Victoria Park as well. But in the end, stay for the music, mm-hmm. discover the music, you know, support the artists by buying their merch, um, understand that these are widely professional acts that come to London that people don't necessarily know. Um, So, yeah, I think that in that sense, that's always been our priority. We always like being known as kind of this opener, door opener for lesser known acts. Because of the fact that we're free, we have a little bit of (sighs) flexibility slash luxury to the fact that we can bring new, brand new emerging acts, you know, that, that not a lot of people know. Mm-hmm. We don't have to sell tickets, so we don't have, a, we don't need to bring a huge commercial act that people know, mm-hmm. but people now know us as a place of discovery. And so therefore we can definitely say, okay, you might not have a million likes on Facebook, maybe you only have like 4,000 likes on Facebook or something like that, but that's okay because mm-hmm. it's about your artistic quality and how great and together your project is, how much you guys have worked on it, how tight do you guys sound, like how exciting are you with the crowd, how do you interact with the crowd, 
So a lot of the times we want to see them live because we want to see that interaction mm -hmm. um, because we know that's how people relate. That's how people get excited. It doesn't, the music itself doesn't have to be boisterous and party sounding. It can be super calm and beautiful, but as long as that interaction and that soulfulness is there, that's what we look for. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's what we want to present. We want to make sure that, um, that people can come together under a big tree and just enjoy and just have fun and connect with each other and forget about, a lot of other issues that are around in the world because in the end what brings us all back and what brings us home is music that's always going to be the way like think mm -hmm. about when you're at home and you know there's a pandemic happening and you know there you can't go outside you can't meet more than five people or something like that what are you going to do you're going to listen to music mm -hmm. what are you going to do when you're cleaning your house you're listening to music taking mm -hmm. a bath listening to music um going for a drive you know having dinner music is always there and mm -hmm. so that's something I think we, a lot of us share in common. And so it's that commonality that I think that's what makes the festival and the organization work as a whole. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Like, <laughs> you know, I, and even just on a, even on a really basic level, music is the one kind of pause that we have right now. There's all this chatter, there's all this, you know, buzz, I think, going on in the world whether it's about the coronavirus or whether it's about, you know, injustices in the world. And the thing is, you know, some people can feel, especially if you're inclined to really care about issues that are happening out, out there, some people are, might feel bad, you know, might feel guilty for mm -hmm. wanting to tune out for a minute. But the mm -hmm. thing with music is that, you know, so not all music, obviously, but there is so often at least some kind of, um, soul or piece of the artist which is put into into that piece of work that you're listening to of course you know? um provided you don't listen to only top 40 <laughs> but even <laughs> then even then you know you can't uh -huh. you can't uh discount that uh or discredit that i mean all. they may have written it in a soulful beautiful way or whatever way they wrote it in but then it just got heavily produced in order to like be distributed into the masses exactly you, know? so, yeah, you can't discount it i completely agree <laughs> yeah you you shouldn't um so it's like, at least for me, I find sometimes when I feel like I want to take a break or when I just need to not hear voices speaking, you know, uh, I listen to music and I feel like I'm still staying connected mm -hmm. at the same time. I'm taking a healthy distance, you know, I'm, I'm recharging of course. Uh, in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. Um, the music that I think Sunfest represents is, is kind of this but to a greater level you know mm -hmm. um just because you bring in acts which come from all parts of the world which represents very different communities so it adds another musical dimension um mm -hmm. to what people in london are consuming but also you know you're just bringing all these people together all these musicians and all these artists together you're going to get something kind of magical out of that Absolutely. And I think that that identification process is important as well, because it's not just about discovery. It's also about, you know, if your family comes from, I don't know, yeah. India and, you know, we present an Indian act, that's exciting. You know what yeah. I mean? You can go and you can see other people listening to it, but you can go enjoy that yourself because perhaps yeah. you don't get a lot of opportunities to hear that live. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. largely a lot of the scene here in London is is great. Don't get me wrong, but you don't necessarily have that diversity and, and, and representation in no. the program. And no. so, and one thing that might be coming out of what's going on in society today is that a lot of these industries are looking at that, especially in the music industry. They're looking no. at how, how has our programming been? How has our, uh, you know, what has our organization, what does our staff look like? You know what I mean? How are we being, how are we being representative to our community? I think a lot of that discussion is happening right now. I'm not sure necessarily about London itself, but I know in the music industry as a whole, it definitely is. And that's a good thing. That's a really good thing. Like in the end, we don't want to be one of the few that do that does it. We want to be able to work with like different people, organizations collaborate because in the end, this is, this is important work. It's important work to ensure that people know that there's more out there than the commercial norm. You know what I mean? And mm. then, and, and they might be, they might have a certain, perspective or thought as to what a culture is like and they just really have no idea you know mm -hmm. and so I think it's really important I think that's one of the silver linings perhaps that's coming out of you know the 
the turmoil that's happening right now, it's been very difficult. Um, I'm sure you as a woman of color, like you understand, like it's it, growing up in London, especially like I think a lot, at least for me personally, there's been a lot of feelings coming up lately of, of, oh, yeah. of things that I've lived through, of things that I've had to challenge myself against, you know, um, and that's traumatizing, you know, that's, that's, that's traumatizing, that's emotional work that needs to happen. But I do see, I do see silver linings and I'm, mm. I'm optimistic about what can come in the future. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned earlier um, about how Sunfest programming has always kind of been around this identification and, and it's an international music festival, right? So uh, that is what it is. Um, so you, you mentioned a little bit how that's informed your programming and mm -hmm how you, Sunfest sees itself and the role that it plays in the world of music in the city of London. What, um, in terms of like, I don't want to say uh, results because this is never, there's never an end result when it comes to representation and especially on issues of race and especially in, in, in the arts and cultural world in a city like London, you know, there's never an end point where it's like, okay, we're we done. did our work, we're done. Yeah, everything's good now. <laughs> Um, but in terms of over the years, uh, I'm, like, I'm very curious to know how, how was Sunfest received mm -hmm. and also like what has been the, the ensuing sort of layers that maybe have been unfolded or what has been like the trajectory of Sunfest in the cultural community in London, um, mm -hmm. either like both in the communities that are showing up and also in the communities that are maybe like, what is this thing happening here? <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, you know, that's a, that's a very layered question because mm -hmm. um, in terms of at the beginning, I mean, I think people didn't think that we would survive this long or get as big as we did, to mm -hmm. be honest. Um, I think people thought, oh, this is a cool three-day event. There's bands from all over. It's a multicultural festival. You know, that's fantastic. And there's your spot and you're great. Yeah. Goodbye. See you yeah. next year you know, and then nothing else happens. Um, and, you know, whereas things have gotten, the reception from the public has always been fantastic. Like okay. people love it. Like people love going to it. They love discovering. They love just live music in general. I mean, I think in London, we know we love live music. You know what I mean? And, but just going and because it's free, there's no investment in your part other than the effort to get there and to spend there. You know what I mean? To spend time there and actually try and you know, receive what, what you're receiving, the messages and the different, you know, cultural expressions that you're receiving. Um, and we have actually always prioritized representing as many different communities as possible. Mm -hmm. um, it's quite simply because it's important. It's important work. There's no other institution or event that really tries to say, hey, let's try to get as many different acts as possible from all different corners of the world because it's important to have that representation. And there's definitely lots of countries mm -hmm. that we've never presented from just simply because we're, we weren't informed of a band coming from there or perhaps like, you know, we, our bill was full because in the end there's only certain time and resource, there's certain time and resource uh, limitations that we have. Mm -hmm. um, we can't present everybody, unfortunately. We would love to, but we can't. Um, and so, but we try our best to say, hey, like, if there's two groups that are one are up against the other and one's from a country we've never presented before, we'll go with the one that we've never presented before because mm -hmm. it's important to us to have that representation, have people come with their flags, you know what I mean? And like, be excited. I mean, last year we had a Palestinian group, um, 47 soul. It was the first Pal oh. Palestinian group we've ever presented. Yeah. And we had people and coming. They're big. With flag. Yeah, they're big. They're big. Uh, thank you for knowing that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <They're big. laughs> Huge. Like yes. we, had a, we had a graphic designer work with us last year. She was from Syria and she said, these, these guys are huge. They're always playing yeah. on people's bars and radios and things like that. I'm like, yeah, they are. And like, nobody knows, you know, but people came, the, the ones who knew, knew. And mm -hmm. so there are people, you know, with their flags dress or dancing traditionally in front of the stage. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. But then there was also everyone else who didn't know them just enjoying them because they're a fun band. You know, they had, um, they have amazing music. They have a, a really great message as well. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's something that we've always strived for. We want that element of discovery, but also that element of identification from those communities. Right. 
And so because of that, and because we try to do that, we've actually won several diversity awards and recognitions um, for fostering diversity relations, because in the end, that's our message. We want everyone to come. Doesn't matter what age, socioeconomic status, gender, religion, everything, come. Like, mm -hmm. just come, have fun. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we also want to ensure it's a safe space. So we do have, like, a vast patrol team and things like that to make sure that everyone's doing all right. And knock on wood to this day, we haven't had a major issue. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that just goes to show you the attitude that people have when they come to the festival. We've mm -hmm. fostered that attitude. If it's a positive environment, it's not meant for anything else other than positivity and inclusion and acceptance. Um, and hopefully we can keep doing that message. We'll see what happens after COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's our whole point. And, you know, us personally, um, you know, we put in tons of work all year looking for money, sponsorships, grants, et cetera, to keep it free, um, to work in the industry, et cetera. And then obviously the few weeks before the, or the few months before the festival, it's just like, go, go, go in terms of logistics. So it's very stressful because it is a very big event. There's lots of little key details that you have to take care of. And so in the end, I always tell my staff, I tell myself, I tell my family, I say, don't work the entire time. Go take a couple hours and enjoy music. Mm. Watch the people dance. Watch the people having fun. Because in the end, it doesn't matter what chaos is going on behind the band shell. Let's put mm -hmm. it that way. In the end, what matters is the band is playing, people are having fun. Mm -hmm. That's all that matters. Mm -hmm. That's all that matters in the end because that's what we work for throughout the year. And I, I make sure to take my time to go and enjoy an act that I'm excited to bring, that I'm excited to see how the people receive them because I know how great they are. I'm excited to just dance with my friends that are visiting, you know, uh, like I, I take my time to still enjoy the festival, even if it's just for five minutes at a time, I still mm -hmm. do it. You know, <laughs> because mm -hmm. there's lots of stuff that's going on, but that's what I told my staff was that, no, 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 you're stressed out. Go take a break, like go take a break, go enjoy the music because that's what that's about. And that's mm -hmm. why people love the festival. So that's why you need to understand what you're doing this work for. Mm -hmm. Um, so Yeah. Those two things, band plays, people are there. That's all that matters. <laughs> awesome. Everything else can be chaos. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, that's would be nice to work with you. <laughs> I try my best. Staff is very lucky. <laughs> so I wanna I wanna ask you then, what's um and, and let me know if, if I don't say this clearly, but I'm I'm so curious to ask you, what is your relationship to the music that you bring, that you typically bring in for Sunfest and the artists that you typically scout and want to bring in for Sunfest and your own personal music consumption patterns. Like, do you, uh, you know, are these acts that you bring in that you also listen to uh, just personally, that you personally enjoy bringing in? Also, how do you even keep up with, you know, the, the whole world of music outside of, of you know, North America? Yeah. Uh, how do you keep up with all these different artists there? And is that your, like your personal listening taste and what's like your personal listening pattern and how does it relate to what you bring in with Sunfest? I'm going to give the typical answer that everybody gives. I love so many different genres. <laughs> uh, I listen to everything. I, I listen to everything. Um, there okay. are genres that I don't supremely enjoy, but mm -hmm. that I respect. Um, you know, I don't love commercial top 40 music just because to me it all kind of sounds the same. Yeah. Um, in the sense that, you know, I can listen to it when I'm at a restaurant or a bar or something like that. And so I always have opportunities to listen to them. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to scouting, absolutely, it reflects what we listen to. Yes, mm -hmm. personally, it does. Um, do I listen to more genres personally when I'm, you know, alone yeah absolutely i listen to a lot more latin music you know what i mean or i listen to like r&b and hip-hop um or jazz I'm a huge jazz fan mm -hmm. um personally those are the genres that i veer towards but when it comes to selection top of mind would be artistic quality and representation mm -hmm. um and in, and to me it's not about checking a box not at all it's just simply because i want to personally discover and so if I discover, that means that so many other people are going to discover as well, because in the end, I listen to so many genres of music that I know there are some that I do not know. And there are definitely some that others don't know if I don't know them either. Mm -hmm. So it's really important for me to have that kind of representation. And then when we go and scout um, music, 
you know, just to give you an example, I mean, there's so many different avenues and ways in ways that we receive music. We receive them through email, like people send us our EPK, their EPKs. Um, we have really good uh, relationships with managers and agents who say, I'm representing this new band, check them out. Um, and then our main priority is, are the music markets. So we've been really fortunate that because the way in which that we have been programming, it has been um, representative and it has been uh, almost like a door opener for a lot of acts to come into Canada. We get, we then are very, very fortunate that we are invited to many conferences and music markets around the world mm -hmm. uh, because they know that we book the artists. And so we, as artistic directors, myself and my dad, we make a priority for when we're invited to a music market, we book at least one band, you know, that we saw there. And the way that we choose when we're there, a couple different things go into that is one, first and foremost, was the live music showcase, was that good? Mm -hmm. Like, did they connect with us? Did we connect with them? I think other, I think so many people have a way, a personal way in which they feel the music. So it could be a feel, a physical feeling, could be a mental thing, could be a visual thing. You know what I mean? Like some people see colors when they listen to music. Um, mm -hmm. And for us, it's just that feeling that we get when we hear really great music and we love it. And so we either approach the manager or agent or they approach us. And from there, we see who's committed, who's committed to coming to Canada. Um, and because coming to Canada is not easy. Like a mm. lot of people think it is, but it is not. Because first and foremost, Canada is very expensive. It's expensive to travel in between. It's expensive to stay at different places in between acts. I mean, if you think about the festival season in the summer, um, you have, let's say, Sunfest one weekend. Next weekend, you'll have Home County. The weekend after that, you'll have or Rocka Park, the weekend after that, you'll have Home County, then you'll have another festival around. So it's mostly weekends, mm -hmm. right? So it's very, very difficult for bands to tour. Mm -hmm. And because then they have to see what they do during the week. Can they find a club gig? That probably won't make them very much money. It might just be, you know, they get some percentage of the door fee, or they have to pass around a hat. Are they willing to live through that? Are they willing to invest their time? And like, I wish we could you know, pay them thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for them to just, you know, be okay and like pay for their hotel throughout the whole time. Just chill, relax, enjoy the country, go see Niagara Falls. Um, some people can do that. Other people can't. So it's about the commitment that the band has to tour and to tour life. And any mu musician will tell you tour life is, is difficult because you're yeah. constantly thing, right? Yeah. Um, so it's about, did they, were they able to receive government help? to pay for their flights, you know, to come over because then that way it reduces our costs exponentially. And that way we can leave more room for other acts to come as well. Mm -hmm. um, have they reached out to other festivals, you know? So it's, it's really like this huge process to bring just one band. Mm -hmm. And so it's a constant communication um, exercise, I guess you could say, to ensure that they're keeping up with us. And because we have so many acts that want to come, we have to ensure that we're, working with those who are very dedicated to come and, and showcase their art, showcase their music. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's different facts. That's a long winded, winded answer for like how we picked our artists. But I think in the end, it's just quality and representation like that. Those are the two main things that we always come back to mm -hmm. um, quality being number one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. But it definitely does. It's funny, like I, I grew up with music. My, my dad's a musician. Um, I'm a musician as well. I don't perform, but I'm a trained musician. Um, and it's just always represented what we have going on in our homes. You know, when I was growing up at my parents' place, we always had music playing. Could be Iranian music, could be Spanish music, could be uh, Chilean music. It could be, you know, you know from all over. Uh, we listen to it because we like it, you know, mm -hmm. and it's fun and it's exciting. Um, and yeah, it definitely represents, sometimes we'll be listening to something or maybe it's a Spotify playlist or something like that. Something random will come on. We'll be like, what's that? Mm -hmm. And we'll look into it, you know, and we'll say, this is great. <laughs> this would be great at the festival. You know? Oh yeah. So there's, there's so many different avenues in which that we've discovered different bands and reached out to them and asked them to come, things like that. So, you know. So um, let's say in, in like, what year was Sunfest started? What year was the first festival? 95. Mm -hmm. So let's say, so back, so in 95, how did your father and uh, whoever was working with him to book artists, how did you find artists from around the world? It seems almost so, like impossible to conceive of right now. It's like, what, you don't have the internet? You couldn't, yeah. what did you do? <laughs> you use the phone? What? 
<laughs> you know those things that with the, the different like papers in them, the Rolodex. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I think it became it was because for for two reasons. For one thing, um, my father used to work for the Cross Cultural Learner Center, and so he uh, was doing um, different events there in order to. Um, me representative to the immigrant communities that were coming to London. Um, and, you know, with his co-founder, I think, or the, the people that worked with him, everything, um, essentially what, it was his idea, let's do a festival out of this, because we start, they started a program called the Between, Between Cultures Arts Dialogue. And mm -hmm. so for one weekend throughout the year at the downtown library, actually, there would be storytelling, there would be visual arts presentation, there'd be music presentations of mostly local and regional artists, mm. um, but representative of different cultures from around the world. And so the first festival, there's one international act and the rest were Canadian acts, national acts, but that represented other cultures. So they were based in Canada, mostly based in the Ontario region. Um, and yeah, it was just co personal connections. As I said, my dad's a musician, um, so he would reach out to his connections, who reached out to their connections, mm. and that's how the music was found. Um, I mean, there was, uh, we had a really beautiful moment at uh, this World Music Expo that we were at in Finland, in Tempere, Finland, this past October. And one of the very first acts that presented at Sunfest in 1995 is called the Toronto Tabla Ensemble. And they're still going. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful group organization that promotes Indian music, especially through tablas, um, dance, and, you know, um, just cultural expression and education. And the leader of the Toronto Tabla Ensemble, we hadn't seen him since 1995. And he came over and said, this was my first Womax. This is my first time being here. I can't believe how big you guys have gotten. I've just never been able to go back as a visitor because I'm busy that weekend. But, you know, we just gave each other a hug saying hello. And he's like, I knew you guys would be big. I knew you guys would be awesome and like lasting forever. And we're, I'm so happy for you. We're all just like with tears in our eyes crying mm -hmm. saying, you know, it was, it's been such an effort. It's been such a huge mm -hmm. effort to get to where we are and we're still struggling. We're still going, we're still trying to find money left, right and center and justifying why we exist, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, the first festival was just largely a labor of love. Um, it was, you know, volunteer by everybody involved. Mm -hmm. To this day, we're about 90% volunteer run. Mm -hmm. So, and especially all the extra hours that we put in as well, very largely volunteer run. Um, and it's a not-for-profit. Everything that we, all the revenues that we make, we put right back into the programming. So it is largely because we're passionate about it. And that's how we continue to program not only the artists, but the activities that come involved alongside with it. Um, just for this year, we had several different programming initiatives ready to go but you know we're gonna have to wait to 2021 for that but it's, it's specifically because we contribute so much to the industry that we want to make sure that we have that hub here in london as well and that people come and see what's offered in london too you know mm. and on top of that we want to make sure that it's a little bit we feel that the festival is very hands-on if you look at the stages there's no barriers in front of them or anything like that people can go and talk to the artist afterwards um there's no backstage let's say mm -hmm. um and that's on purpose that's on purpose for people to meet each other um and so but we wanted to make we wanted to make it even closer so we wanted to set up a, bit, a few workshops so that people understand maybe you know, the background to the, the Quattro from Venezuela, you know, or like the or Brazilian drum beats or, you know, um, different ways to cook, what different culture, types of cuisine. So it was largely um, a multicultural and anti-racist initiative that we wanted to do. Um, so hopefully we can t continue to do that digitally. We're trying to figure out how to do it um, just because, you know, funds are limited. We want to make sure people are paid um, and that people have access to them as well. Mm -hmm. Do people come out of town uh, to see the Sunfest in London? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which, How, yes. <laughs> I, I bet they do. How, yeah. like, what's, what, what do you think the reach is for, for Sunfest across Canada? We actually did an economic impact study last year. Um, we did it with a reputable um, consulting agency that helped to set it up and do it and analyzed it for us. And one in four people come from out of town. Wow. Our tour. And so, and these are largely from the Northern uh, US border states. Mm -hmm. uh, we have people coming internationally as well, just because they, they might've been already coming to Canada, but they wanted to come to Sunfest. And so it was extra motivation for them. Mm -hmm. um, we, 
We have always said that our radius for driving has been eight hours, and that has definitely been confirmed. People have flown in from Seattle, flown in from PEI. A lot of people come from Detroit. There's a busload of people that come from Dayton, Ohio. Wow. Wow. Um, we've had, we have people come in from Chicago, not just for our festival, but for a concert series as well, depending on the acts that we play or that we uh, present. Um, and so, yeah, one in four are out of town and it could be from other parts of Ontario, but it's definitely from Northern States, uh, Quebec, Manitoba, and just from all over. So we were so happy that <laughs> what we've been touting this whole time was actually true. And mm -hmm. we had data to back it up. And we actually have a $5 million impact in the region for it. So even though we're free, people are spending and spending money. And so we do support our local tourism industry, the hospitality industry. Um, and we're sad that we can't help them this year either. You know what I mean? We hope that we could. Um, and so, and we know largely from bars and cafes that are, surround the park that they make a colossal amount of money throughout that weekend because people at 11 o'clock, they want to go somewhere. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? They want to see the party. Um, so we're proud of that fact. Um, I think for a long time it was largely under recognized, um, because I think that the city of London has put priority on other events, such as sporting events or perhaps large commercial acts, things like that. Um, and, you know, sometimes we do receive this criticism of, you know, not presenting local. And I say that in quotes because we do present local acts. We present one to two local acts amongst the 40 acts that we, 35 to 40 acts we present every year, at least one or two of them are from London. And so we do that specifically because we want to support our community, but also at the same time, you know, these local acts have opportunities to play other events and stuff. So we want to make sure we make that room mm -hmm. for other underrepresented voices as well. So mm -hmm. we support our local community. We support our local vendors. We support our local music, uh, our local venues as well. We use, use them throughout the year. We, we use Aeolian Hall, London Music Hall, Chaucer's Pub, um, several different venues throughout London that we've used. We present 15 to 20 um, concerts throughout the year. We also use TAP, uh, you know, create a center for creativity. We use that for um, visual art exhibits. Mm -hmm. So we definitely collaborate and we want to continue to collaborate and we want to support our local economy. We want to make sure that we're an important part of that, an important partner. Mm -hmm. um, we think it's really important to do um, and we're, we're not going to stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're going to continue to partner as much as possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you know, the, I think it's really important to understand the mandate and the whole purpose for living for a festival like Sunfest, you know, you're having an international festival because I, I lived in Montreal, right? Home of, home of festivals Montreal in Canada. Festival. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so many. We definitely, and, amazing. Yes. And honestly, I would, I would, after having been there, you know, living there and going to the Montreal International Jazz Festival a couple of times. Um, also the Nuit d'Afrique Festival, yeah. which is specifically oh, like happens. an African music festival, um, which happens just right after the jazz festival does. Yeah. You know, the, and I see just the, how that alone is, it impacts the city. You know, it mm -hmm. impacts the culture of the city. It impacts how the residents in the city feel about their own, about the space that, that they're living in. And it also mm -hmm. brings in people from all over, you know, all over the province, Absolutely. all over the rest of Canada, from other countries. Yep. Um, and that is so valuable for a city to have, you know, and it's almost like Sunfest in, in London is, is kind of surprising that it's in a, in a city like London, you know, but at the same time, it's such a gift. Uh, yeah. It, it's such a yeah, gift. Yeah, because the, the money that people would normally spend on a ticket, let's say, for a three to four day event, mm -hmm. they can invest that now in hotel. They mm -hmm. can invest that now in, you know, buying meals. They can invest that in doing little day trips throughout the day and then coming back in the evening or vice versa, mm -hmm. you know. So it really does help people to not only have access to this, um, to this music, but also helps them plan and prepare mm -hmm. and, and, and live their best lives in the sense of like, you know, <laughs> being able to travel and being able to visit different places. Mm -hmm. um, so the fact that it's free, I mean, it wasn't intentionally set out that way in terms of like, well, that way people can spend on hotels. You know, that mm -hmm. wasn't our intention. It, our intention was access and inclusivity. Mm -hmm. um, but we're happy that that's a byproduct of it. And we're happy to continue contribute, contributing to that. Because in the end, 
we never want to charge for the festival ever because it's so important to have something that's accessible because think of a, a newly landed refugee or immigrant family that have no resources but then see that on the bill there's a band from the country from which they come from or, or a country that surrounds their country so they're mm -hmm. they understand it they understand mm -hmm. that culture mm -hmm. we want them to be able to access that we don't want them to be shy and, and not reach out and say hey we just came to Canada, we can't afford it, can we come? No, we don't want them to go through that. We want mm -hmm. them to be able to just come and enjoy. So mm -hmm. I think that's really important. And I think Montreal has always been um, that, almost that goal in way in the way that we want to present the, the festival. We've mm -hmm. always wanted to set down streets and mm -hmm. make the complete downtown about music that weekend. I mean, yeah. when you think about the fact that Montreal shuts down, their downtown and their streets make them pedestrian this yes. huge massive city what is it the second or third largest city in canada yeah and they shut the downtown down just for arts and culture that's a several thing. times in the summer several times several yeah, not just much. for the jazz festival not just several yeah. times over yeah. all summer and, yeah and who has adjusted who has adjusted? the businesses downtown have adjusted the people have adjusted to it they understand what's happening and the people from outside of montreal have adjusted because they know that that's happening yeah. And so that motivates them to come. Yeah. So in the end, arts and culture is always going to be not only a revenue generator, but it'll be, it'll have so much social impact to your city and it'll make mm -hmm. it so vibrant. Mm -hmm. And so I just hope that one day we can do that with Sunfest as well. It's just outpour it onto the streets. We already shut down Wellington, but we, we want to shut down more. We want to shut down Dundas Place. We want to shut down Richmond. Like We want to shut it all mm -hmm. down because we want people to just go out and wander go from stage to stage, go from business to business. You know, the businesses com can come out, create a sidewalk market. That would be amazing. How mm -hmm. beautiful is that, right? Mm -hmm. Just to have people celebrating in the streets. I think that'd be mm -hmm. so great. But that's always been, yeah, like a top goal for us. So we'll see if one day we can make it happen. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. You just got to keep pushing and keep doing what you guys are doing because you're doing something yeah. incredible for the city. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and I hear you with that city programming thing. Like we... That's why we need more people from communities of color, mm -hmm. uh, from immigrant communities, from also from a background of just valuing arts and culture as not just a revenue generator, but as something that people need, <laughs> you know, really? like we need, yeah. it's not fun and games. Like we really need this. It, it helps with quality of life a whole lot. And mm -hmm. in, in a city like London where, you know, I, I, we have we're a city that has resources you know mm -hmm. where where we have certain kinds of resources to a lot to different spaces and places um so to have more programs that like sunfest which you know just every single year you you show up and you're there and you deliver uh i i think it just takes time you know yeah it, it, it takes time to eventually trickle upwards into uh the priorities of, of the city planners and, and mm -hmm. the budgeting and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but you're right. You're right. A, a thing like that would, a setup like that would definitely be beneficial to London in so many ways that I don't think people realize. Yeah. I think, you know, in the end, what do you value about summer or what do you value about life in general? A lot of the times it's gatherings with people, you know, mm -hmm. gatherings with others. So for us, our main success of the festival has always been the social impact of the event. Yeah, yeah. The fact that people feel free and feel included and want to discover. And, you know, some of the messaging that we've gotten on social media, some of the comments after we postponed to next year were not only amazing and but they were super bittersweet because it was like it's so great that we've impacted your life this way and we're sad we can't do it this year mm -hmm. again you mm -hmm. know because a lot so many people tell us you know that's the only time my friend my family from toronto will ever come to london is during sunfest because <laughs> they didn't nobody wants to leave toronto and so, <laughs> but they'll come to london for that or um you know that's when i uh, host a big dinner and then we go and enjoy the music for the evening or that's mm. the only time you know one time I received a, a, a comment was saying that the only happy memory with my family is at Sunfest wow. and that just like breaks my heart makes me want to cry but it breaks my heart in a good way in the sense of like I'm happy that we provided that for you guys and because in the end it is my family that does it and so mm -hmm. I'm happy that that translates to other families as well so mm -hmm. it's it's largely an effort from the bottom of our hearts and we hope that people receive that message positively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for next year, uh, are you already planning ahead for what to do next year? 
Of course, of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so a lot of the um, acts that we were going to present this year, um, a, a few of them are on the live stream uh, for this weekend, July 10 and 11, mm -hmm. um, but pretty much all of them are, are just being shifted into the next street into the next year because they're amazing acts we would hate for people to to miss out on them and so we're going to try our best to keep the same program that mm -hmm. we were planning for this year it just all depends on funding what the situation's like with covid uh i think just like every and we're not alone in that every single organization and venue and industry really is just waiting to see but i think for the live music industry we're all just holding our breath right now hoping for the best hoping that um solutions can be found um, you know, or regulations, you know, come into place that we can then just adhere to and, and follow to ensure the safety of everybody that attends. But definitely, I think that postponing till next year, not just us, but every other event, it was the right thing to do. It was the safest thing to do. Uh, in the end, we want people to be safe. And so therefore, next year, whatever rules we have to implement, we'll do it because we want people to continue to enjoy. We don't want people to lose hope either. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to make sure that they're, they have a place to go to for next year and that we have something pr to present to them for next year. Mm -hmm. So we're already planning. We already have, you know, um, like I said, our lineup is pretty much done. <laughs> it's just about ensuring um, that we can financially do it and that it's feasible. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's always going on in the back end. <laughs> never stops. It never, it never stops. stops. Yeah, yeah. And in the meantime, seeing how we can adapt to this new re digital reality, um, how we can continue to reach people, how we can continue to, um, have a diverse uh, program in terms of not only music, but others, because, you know, I think as we said before, um, this does present an opportunity to showcase what we do outside of London, and in fact, internationally. So even through these, this digital stream that's coming up this weekend, um, a lot of the acts are gonna be promoting themselves, and so a lot of their audience that could be, you know, in Sweden or South Korea, don't know about it. And so they'll tune in to the live stream and see, hey, who is Sunfest and find out about Sunfest, find out about London. So that's exciting. That's that's a really cool opportunity that's being offered right now. Um, and because we're cognizant of the, um, I guess, competition that's going on online right now, because there's so many live streams, there's so many digital events happening at once. Uh, we tried to partner with as many of our partner organizations and organizations that are like-minded organizations as well to say, don't program, any, don't program anything that weekend. Help us stream our event and then we'll do the same for you. So mm -hmm. we partnered up really well that way in order to decrease competition mm -hmm. and that way and also increase our, our marketing reach and increase our messaging to other audiences that might not have known about it before. Because for to give you an example, um, Cool Troon slash Naruto Arts that's based in Kitchener-Waterloo, we tend to be the, on the same weekend. And so, you know, if you're coming to Sunfest in London, you might not go to Kitchener Waterloo to enjoy Kultrun or vice versa. So in this case, they can then enjoy what we program and then we, they can then enjoy what Neruda programs through our channels once they do their digital event as well. So mm. it's an exciting partnership in that sense, you know, um, that's a silver lining that's come out of this is that I feel like collaboration is at, it's at a high right now. We want to make sure we're learning from each other that we're working together. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm happy about that aspect as well. I've never had such open communication with so many other different organizations and presenters across Canada and across the uh, U S as well. So that's been a really exciting endeavor. That's cool. That's really mm -hmm. cool to hear about. Yeah. Because it, there's no siloing anymore, even though we're all isolated. Um, yeah. If you if you stay isolated, you're gonna go crazy. <laughs> so so arts organizations and artists and and whoever is working in in that world, um, you know you, you almost have no choice but to speak with people who are doing similar things to to what you are to either exactly. work together to figure out how you're gonna make it out of this to figure out you know best practices or just yeah. to make a connection and say yeah you know, I came across what you're doing online because now everything has, has moved to a free and open and widely accessible space. Mm -hmm. um, if you're lucky enough to, to sift through it and come across an organization or a festival or a group of artists who you feel like would have a very rewarding collaboration with you, then, mm -hmm. you know, there's nothing stopping you from going after that right now. 100%. Yeah, no, 100%. I think it's so important to do. It's important, as you said, for working together, for just sharing insights, but also just having a shoulder to cry on sometimes, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because we 
and the struggles that's that are happening right now and you know i think everyone no matter the industry like we're all going through these hardships right now mm -hmm. and um you know the live music industry unfortunately will be the last one to come out of this of this pandemic of this think, of this so? turmoil i do because our sole purpose is to gather people you know? yeah <laughs> our sole purpose is to gather people together and yeah. you know um so the the live events yeah we have live streams things like that that's another way in which we're innovating but it's not it's not what we set out to do what we set out to do is to gather people around live music so mm -hmm. it's it's hard when you're in, in an industry that and you're not providing any kind of service right so you're not a restaurant that offers food you're not you know a bar that offers drinks or you know things like that so i think for us our product is that live music aspect and that gathering aspect so it might not come back the way that we know it for a very long time might come back in different ways could come back in really creative you know um very intimate shows things like that which are beautiful as well mm -hmm. um but again it doesn't create that huge gathering that we always set out to do yeah i hear you mm -hmm. yeah I was, I was telling you on the phone the other day that there's a part of me that when i see all these different um live stream events that are going on i'm just like man i, I hope people don't get too comfortable doing this <laughs> Because I'm really, you know, we we can't not have in-person festivals and in-person music events, you know, yeah. as yeah. as musicians, as people who love music, as artists, that's, it's it's not even that, that's not what we set out to do. Like, we can't do that. You know what I mean? We, we can't live off of just that and not have, oh. you know, not have that intimacy, that space, that experience anymore. Uh, <laughs> for yeah. now we can deal with it though yeah. we i thought of different ways too i was like what if we you know just do a bunch of picnic tables and then you can only stay at your picnic table and you can't <laughs> move from there. or if we did kind of what trinity bellwoods did with their big circles you know what i mean uh -huh. what if we did that you know but then that's exclusionary and that's not you know you have to yeah. you know first come first serve and not everybody yeah. can enjoy and so it's hard to put on an event like ours um and ensure that it's has the maximum amount of impact that we would want it to have yeah. it would just kind of it would be a version that we would make do with but you know in the end we'll see what the regulations are for next summer mm -hmm. there might be things like that we might have to you know have more people volunteer help us out to to do it to enforce rules things like that um but you know we'll see what happens in the end we're we're a creative industry so we're going to find creative solutions to it and that i have no doubt about mm -hmm. that um, and as I, I think I told you on the phone, I'm excited for the music that's going to come out of this. I mean, musicians have yeah. been cooped up at home. They got nothing else yeah, to do. I was just about to say that. <laughs> yeah, we're going to so, have a renaissance. Absolutely. I think yeah. it's going to be amazing. And I think in 2021, 2022, and future, there's going to be amazing albums that are, that are going to come out. And there's going to be new beats, new genres, new everything, expressions that I'm super excited for. Maybe mm -hmm. there'll be a punk rock revival because people are in turmoil. So, you know, that's, you know, it's anarchy. People want to like step up <laughs> and pent up. Maybe punk rock. <laughs> we don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think everything is everything is fair game, you know. Absolutely. Everything is fair game, especially right now. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. No, it'll be good. <laughs> yeah. I'm positive. I'm optimistic about it. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>